Welcome to ESGX Live, where we bring information and real world experience from the front lines of sustainability to inspire collaboration and action. With me, Nigel Lake in New York, and hopefully my co-host Paul Herman in Paris will join us during the show today. We're going to be joined by Ryland Engelhart from Kiss the Ground and Rodin Janoff, who's currently in Stockholm in Sweden, uh, who has a background in all sorts of things to do with ecosystems and clusters. Uh, and we're going to be talking about the bioeconomy. And I wanted to start very briefly by just saying, why are we here? Why is this so important? Why do we see, why do I see such an enormous opportunity here? And at one level, we live on a world which has finite capacity and we already know many of us that we have reached beyond the boundaries of that planet's capacity to support life we use well more than one earth a year as a species and indeed if you're in america as i am the figure is really pretty shocking and yet we we don't really see that in our day-to-day -day lives one statistics I learned in the last year or so was that 96% of the body weight of all mammals on the earth is people or the food we're about to eat, which seems really shocking. And figures are similar for birds. About two thirds of the birds on the planet are things we are breeding for food, which is mostly chickens with an expected life of a few weeks. We eat five grams of plastic a week on average, typically coming in your water. Now, six years ago, I was in Germany and I was the slightly crazy act at the Long-Term Infrastructure Investors Association's third annual conference, talking about this unusual new infrastructure asset class that was going to emerge called renewable energy. And of course, now every Renew every infrastructure fund has got a billion dollar or ten billion dollar or tens of billions of dollars fund dedicated specifically to renewables. And the really interesting thing as we look at how agriculture is going to evolve and how the bioeconomy might come together is that different mis business models can make our entire agricultural system more like infrastructure and reduce some of the uncertainty and create some really lo interesting long term investment opportunities. The other reason, of course, looking much closer to home and in much shorter term time frames, is we have seen very clearly the risks in our entire ecosystem in which we live, not just natural in the natural world, but economically and financially, of all of the supply chains and webs which are constraining the world we're in today. Russia's war on Ukraine, loss of access to grain, dependence on fertilizers, and this creates all sorts of challenges. So with that, you know, slightly dark, but also optimistic note, I'd love Ryland to join us. And you know, when we were talking beforehand, Ryland, you were making the point that you, know, you are 10 years into a journey. And whilst there are many challenges, you have a real sense of hope as to what is possible in a way that perhaps might might have been more difficult to imagine 10 years ago. Yeah, thank you, Nigel. Um, great to be here with you all. And uh, yeah, I was sharing that uh, really, we as human beings live inside of um, possibilities or no possibility. Do we see a pathway forward or do we not? Um, do we see an opening or do we see, you know, a closed door and really the, the idea and the concept of regeneration and going beyond the um, framework of sustainability is really inspiring and keeps me energized because um, when I think about uh, the future of life on planet earth and I think about uh, where we are and the degeneration that has consistently happened across so many of our ecosystems um, in service of our commerce or in service of, you know, um, pulling natural resources um, to, to build the infrastructure and build what we need for life on planet Earth as human civilizations. Um, regeneration uh, gives 
this um, nexus, this merger of how nature's technology um, can produce abundance um, while leaving the environment that it came from uh, also in abundance. And that the, the principles of nature, as, as I said, nature's technology um, that has over 500 million years of R&D uh, is quite a perfect, perfected technology. And if we could design our agricultural systems to support that uh, land function, uh, we, we have a real pathway of that's, that's hopeful and gives a horizon of hope that we can live into um, that actually can create uh, health resilience for human beings and our needs, as well as for the living planet that we depend on. Yeah, and I was going to say, absolutely, because you, you know, there are no unemployed squirrels and there are never too many leaves on the trees. These natural systems work to keep themselves in balance. And I wonder, are there any, you know, is, is, are there any really practical things that you see that, you know, bring to life? What is the opportunity? What are things that people can do or farmers or businesses can do that really, you know, where you just see an, there's an easy thing where play, people can start. Yeah, I mean, this is this is you know, I'm I'm, I'm thinking about um, my dad is a, a farmer on a 21 acre farm in Vacaville, California, and um, you know his his vision of regenerative agriculture, and this is obviously many people's um, one piece of it is you know essentially. The more, as you said, we have more leaves on trees. Uh, uh, leaves are solar panels collecting carbon and um, energy, and you know, creating more life in the soil and more abundance above soil. Um, so, you know, just from a, a, a concept of you know understanding this, that we the more solar light that we can capture on every piece of land, um, you know, is the opportunity of creating more abundance um, for nourishment and for material or raw materials, and also more nourishment for uh, the life uh, beneath our feet and in our soils. Um, so uh, I, I don't think that was the, that wasn't exactly the the, the practical uh, thing, you know. Again, um, but that's just what came to mind. And yeah, and so it prompts the question because I know, you know, in my work if I talk about regenerative agriculture, there, there will be some in, in the agricultural community that, that think that this is to, to really talking about going back to the way that agriculture was done and dragging everybody back to the 19th century. But it's, it's enormously more sophisticated than that. So I don't know if you, you know, whether in the context of your dad's farm, you want to share any particular examples of how this works. Yeah, I mean, I think just one example of, um, you know, and again, I, I, I always like to preface that, um, you know, I've been a, I, I've been a good PR person for soil and a good PR person for regenerative agriculture. Uh, you know, I'm not a farmer, scientist, or even academic on the topic, um, but I've been passionately understanding uh, soil, soil ecosystems and regenerative agriculture over the last 10 years and been a big advocate for it and creating content and awareness building materials to have that story be a more emergent idea. Um, and, you know, I mean, the, you know, the, that John Deere, the largest sort of equipment manufacturing company in the world making farm equipment, um, makes no-till drills, which is essentially um, a way to uh, plant your plants without tilling and um, breaking up the soil, which is ultimately, you know, one of the tenets or principles of regenerative agriculture is, you know, minimal or um, less disturbance in your soil, because the soil is alive. And the more we disturb it, um, you know, the more degraded it becomes, and the more dependent we become on these um, external uh, fertilizers and inputs which ultimately, as you know, we're in a changing world, we see more and more need to have localized uh, resilience and um, 
yeah, lo localized res resilience and localized dependencies versus dependencies, um, you know, from all around the world. Yeah, I, I think that's that's absolutely right. And I know, you know one uh, one example that I've followed is what's been done in the UK at a place called Nep Estate, which is a very long established dairy business, been going something like 500 years and had followed down the path of more and more industrialization. So absolutely the archetypal 20th century approach of trying to make farming more and more efficient through thoroughly man-made processes and eventually faced you know, yet another increasingly large round of investment and decided to get decided instead that they would abandon traditional farming return the entire estate to the wild, which they have now done. Uh, you can't just let your farm become wild. You need an enormous amount of planning permission and they have fences around this thing to keep the wild in. Uh, but what has come about from that, and this is obviously a really extreme example, is enormously greater productivity on that land, massively more plants are growing, the biodiversity, both in animals and insects, is dramatically greater. Species have returned to the UK that haven't been seen for 100 years. And the land has become just extraordinarily more productive. Now, that's at the extreme level of wild and just letting nature do its thing. But there are lots of other examples of businesses. I know we were talking with the one of the bigger farming groups in the UK that started down this path 20 odd years gosh, 80s, no, 30 years ago, 30 plus years ago, because their soil was in a terrible state. And they've been following organic farming, regenerative farming principles now for decades. Soil health is enormously greater, productivity has improved. And again, biodiversity has increased dramatically. And yeah, I think, you know, just to use an example of somebody who's in, you know, my ecosystem or um, you know, uh, the farmer rancher, uh, Gabe Brown, who was featured in the Kiss the Ground film um, that we produced, uh, you know, his economics, he's operating on a 5,000 acre ranch uh, here in the US, and he's making $100 an acre where the average farmer in his, you know, region is making, you know, somewhere between five and $10 an acre. Um, and so, you know, importantly, the, that's profit, not revenue, right? That's right. That's right. Again, one a challenge in agricultural and, and quite a few other industries is there is a tendency to focus on top line revenues and not bottom line profits, and then you miss all the benefits. You know, if you're not tilling your ground, you're spending an all much less money on diesel. As a practical example, and and, and I think just another sort of um, sort of actual factual. Um, reality is that uh, in the U.S., this is specifically because it's kind of where my domain or where I'm focused. But and I think the annual um, debt, you know, farmers go more and more about four percent annually more into debt every year um, in on a continual succession. Um, and we're also le losing about five point six tons of topsoil per acre um, on average in the US. Um, and so that, you know, there's, there's no, there's no way about it when you destroy and lose soil through erosion um, and excess tillage and other things, you need to, you know, input more inputs to get that crop to grow. So in turn, you're in a, a hamster wheel of a, a continuation of needing to put more, um, you know, inputs, which are ultimately rising in costs and ultimately plummeting farmers into greater debt. Yeah. And, and they have long supply chains and, you know, we've obviously already seen challenges with access to fertilizer, cost of fertilizer is just one example. You, you know, the, the industrial system we're running in farming is a really complex one and that is not particularly suited to our times. And it, it probably a good moment to bring in Rodin here. And, you know, we've talked a little bit or we've used the term the bioeconomy a few times. And, of course, you know, we've called that at this episode the bioeconomy because this is about much more than just our food supply chain. But 
maybe Rodin, you could just start with what do we really mean by the bioeconomy? What does it encompass? <laughs> uh, great to be with in, you. in under three hours. Right? <laughs> <laughs> How long is a piece of string? Look, um, I think um, I might sort of narrow it back, if I may, around the work that we've been doing in. Uh, Sweden um, around a, a particular part of the bioeconomy web. And um, we've been looking at um, um, uh, forestry, sawmills, timber, and the whole ecosystem around building and construction. And I think that's been um, such an important part of um, uh, Sweden's building and construction sector. Uh, especially in, in timber. They have a history of, of building in timber. And now, along with the, uh, with the uh, Finland, they're leaders in cross-laminated timber and they're at the heart of future high-rise um, uh, buildings. So one of the things that we've been looking at is how do we create value through that whole value web right through from forestry, um, through to the waste at sawmills that's now creating really fantastic insulation for, for houses and for uh, buildings. And then to think about circular economy and regenerative design um, uh, to support um, um, a really a new generation of building and construction companies. And I think this is where um, so much opportunity exists for industrial trans, uh, transition as we work towards industrial regeneration. Uh, because let's face it, these, these communities, um, they're quite fearful of the future. These are well-paying jobs. They've been in those jobs, for, uh, those communities for generations. And we need to start getting smarter about how we support these communities because, you know, throughout Sweden and, and Denmark and Finland and Germany, we have so much sun infrastructure in schools and health um, into these communities where we need to um, ensure that uh, we can um, support their resilience moving into the future. Yeah, and look, I, I, one of the things I know we've been involved with, and this is in Australia, is a lot of the thinking around an agricultural sector, if you look at an entire industry, and we've done some work in sugar over the last six months, it's very easy to focus on the way that supply chain works today and you grow sugar cane and maybe you use the bagasse, which is the, the leftover bits to create renewable energy through a cogen plant and you make sugar crystals and you sell the sugar crystals and that's the end of it. But there's a whole set of broader opportunities around perhaps better agricultural practices that can drive carbon capture in the soil and create a revenue stream from that. Different uses for the waste material than simply burning it, although that's, you know, it's not a bad source of fuel, but it can be turned into building materials. The cellulosic part of the cane can be used as a feedstock for uh, cellular fermentation processes. There's a whole host of other things. And then, of course, what can you help the communities around all of this? And I might ask Ryland to comment a bit about this. Um, you know, doing things which then help the communities make more of this opportunity themselves, I think is really interesting because it's a great way to overcome some of the resistance you may otherwise find to changing practices in a sector that's often, well, that can be pretty conservative. And just reframe the question one, one more time. So interested in your thoughts around how you can create opportunities in, an, in the communities around farms from this type of activity. I wonder if you've got any perspectives on that or put a different way, what can you do to build support to help drive some of this, these changes? Yeah, so, I mean, again, I'll just speak from my, my experience and you know, my little world of this. Um, you know, we've, we've taken the approach um, within Kiss the Ground as a, you know, an education advocacy nonprofit, really awakening people to the possibilities of regeneration. We do that in a couple ways. We provide education, we provide some of the best educational um, uh, courses to, and we provide them um, 
scholarships for farmers and ranchers who are interested in, you know, they're either hitting a wall in their current framework or their current, you know, system of agriculture and, and you know, how can we provide them a, a, an easy lift and easy access to um, a new view of how agriculture could look on their landscape specifically. Um, one, one way that we do it is providing, you know, educational um, scholarships for farmers and ranchers to go in that provide, uh, we have a, a grant program that provides grants to farmers and ranchers who are heading in this direction. And they're looking at, um, you know, what is some infrastructure um, that I could um, use on my farm that could actually be beyond just helpful in my farm, but actually could be um, exemplify sort of a new direction for a more localized or regenerative food system. Um, for, exist, for example, um, you know, one of our grants that we provided was a um, providing um, the development of a commercial kitchen uh, that helped, um, you know, other farmers be able to produce craft or cottage, you know, products that could be selling directly to, um, you know, their consumers versus selling into um, a commodity or selling, you know, to someone that then sells it again, cutting out the middleman. Um, so those um, are some, and then obviously the other, the big way that Kiss the Ground has been, um, you know, successful is just creating um, content stories, uh, media that really exemplifies uh, working systems. As I communicated before, you know, Gabe Brown is a farmer um, in, uh, in the Dakotas who's now has a, a, an ag consultancy that's actually consulting on over 200 million acres of land uh, called Understanding Ag. And he went from, you know, just managing, uh, you know, 5,000 acres uh, and now his sort of platform and, you know, the, the amount of people looking to him uh, for guidance has grown so much based on his story and his success being exemplified and shared. Uh, it's, a, it's a great example. And that, that's, that's a business. It's called Understanding Ag, you said. Yeah, I would right. love, I'd love to know more about them. We've, we've got a, a, quest, a really good question here about the, the, the effectively the, the, the amount of food that we really have in our food, the nutrient density of food. Uh, you know, and the question is around you know, biodynamic farming, the grandfather to organic agriculture is all about enriching the soil through natural inputs. And this then perhaps driving better quality food. And I can remember reading a statistic about broccoli maybe 10 years ago, which said that you know, the broccoli you're buying today may be you know, twice as big as the broccoli you bought before, but it still has the same amount of broccoli in it. So actually you're getting half as half as much of the nutrients in broccoli as you might have done only a decade or two previously. Wonderful. Either of you got a view around that? Because I think it's, you know, we don't really have any labeling standards for what's in our fruits and vegetables. It's just an apple or an orange or a stick of celery. Yeah. I, I, I'm actually funny. I'm wearing an, a shirt with some oranges on it, but I know there is a study and a statistic that has been being um, used a lot and, you know, been used as a talking point that, you know, in the last 50 years, um, you know, you'd have to eat eight oranges to get the same nutrient profile based on, um, you know, a, an orange from, you know, 50, 60 years ago. Um, and so, you know, there's definitely not a ton of ton of um, science that is, um, you know, validating the superlative nature or the exact uh, specificity of that. But I do know there is more and more science that's showing that, you know, when you have healthy soil, a lot living soil, um, you have this biological process of, you know, just like, you know, in the human body, when we're putting nutrients in our mouth, we don't get access to those nutrients because they went in our mouth. 
we get access to those uh, nutrients because we have the right biology in our gut that can break those down and actually make those bioavailable for us. And soil, healthy soil is, um, and you know, biodynamic agriculture, regenerative agriculture is focusing on that biologically active soil. So in turn, you actually get um, you know, much more um, assimilation and bioavailability of those minerals and those phytonutrients into those foods, which then our body gets to um, consume and we get to be um, you know, that much more healthy and actually receive that much more life from and nutrients from our food. Yeah, so I think it's a great question. It's one that I, I know I continue to reflect on because there's, yeah, it, it's, it's, we should all pay more attention to what it is we're eating. I, I want to come back to Rodin and that this whole question around some of the construction and the, so the things you've been doing in, in the Nordic region. And just as a bit of context, I guess, when I reflect on some of the wider bioeconomy opportunities, one way to think about it is you know, there's some things we use in very large volume in the world. One of them, of course, is oil. And a big chunk of that is used for you know, cars and road transport, a lot of which can be electrified. Uh, but another area of, that's significantly, you know, significant demand for fossil fuels is air travel. And there's no practical way to decarbonize air travel in the near, you know, we can't have electric 737s in the next few decades. Hydrogen is not a solution for those either because the energy density is not good enough. So likely a practical solution, which a whole bunch of airlines are committed to, at least verbally, is to switch to sustainable aviation fuel, which requires very substantive inputs. But another place is building and construction. Of course, you know, bioplastics might be a part, partial solution for that. But the, the thing that you've been doing, Rogan, around helping create more sustainable buildings using wood inputs also as a way of regenerate, helping to rebuild the economy in the Dharma region of Sweden, which of course has been very significantly dependent on forestry for a long time. Again, really interested in your comments around, you know, what have you really been trying to achieve there and, and how have you done that? Yes, um, I'll just um, take a step back um, just around the, the biofuels work and especially the work that you've been doing in the important work that you've been doing in Queensland, uh, Nigel, um, with your uh, company. We, we need to remember that around sugar is a whole industrial ecosystem. And we think about, oh, yeah, we, we chop the sugar, we process it, and then, then that's basically the end of it. But when we think about the industrial ecosystem that's going to support us transition into those industries of the future, we have got so many amazing engineering and electronics companies and fabrication companies throughout northern Queensland that both support mining and sugar and food processing. And I think we just need to get our heads around that because you're about at the moment and we're going talking about biofuels. Well, we've got some extraordinary companies that can support that transition around the development of some really interesting engineering gear, you know, from, from heat exchanges, pumps, compressors, fabrication, um, electronic circuit boards, technology. This is exciting. This is about those industries. And we're thinking about those companies right now that are dependent on coal who can support this transition into these industries of the future and also put food on the table of their families and so they can keep their high wage, um, high paid jobs. So this is a very important part of the equation that we really need to be discussing because also it means more money for investment and those companies can also reinvest in the future as they upskill their workers. And then I just I might just make one observation there, which is, you know, we've had a series. You know, I know we've had analogous conversations about all sorts of different regions, and of course, if you know, mm -hmm. if you're you know, growing fruits on the west coast of the U.S. or you're in yeah. coal-producing regions of Australia or the forestry regions of Sweden and all sorts of others, the particular dynamics and industries that are there are quite different. But the same theme comes up time and time again, which is these high companies with high tech skills and industrial capabilities, which can readily be repurposed to, to the future. 
And I think that's really important because getting back to this, the Swedish example of, of, of this bit of the bioeconomy is that within uh, forestry, we've got GIS services to, to actually map forestry. That also supports regeneration and stewardship of the forest. So that's really interesting uh, dynamic in terms of that technology. Um, we've got um, uh, sawmills that are looking at introducing new surface treatments, and I'll come back to that at the moment. So once again, that is an investment in the future, it's an investment in new technology, it's an investment in those engineering companies that are retooling those sawmills for the future. And of course, they then are producing the timber to produce cross-laminated timber production. And with that, we have all the adhesives to get rid of the toxins out of um, uh, those uh, that uh, production. And then we, at the end, we have the building construction company, the property developers, and the architects now working with life cycle uh, experts to um, to decarbonize that um, the building and construction uh, sector. And supporting that industrial uh, component of that. And this is so important in terms of keeping those highway jobs, uh, automation services, electrical engineering, maintenance services, fabrication and manufacturing. And, and by the way, the, the, the house is called Dark Sky House. Is this the right one? Um, that's one of them. And, and today I was... Um, I was just trying to... I was going to... If you can give me the name, I will find an image of it because... It's it, yes. it's just great to be able to see because apart yes. from anything else, it looks fantastic. Yes, there's the um, the dark si uh, sky house on the uh, Isle of Mon in um, uh, Denmark, which is UNESCO designated island. And and what we were able to do with that uh, building, traditional building company, small family company, um, 15, 16 workers, was to transition them into a circular economy uh, business model. And we said to them, well, look, you know, there's a bunch of uh, quite um, well-heeled Copenhageners, they drive black Teslas, and they would love to live in a really cool sustainable house. And so we created a, a, a model for them and they did the hard work of um, uh, designing this um, uh, circular economy um, inspired house, uh, which they're continuing to build. But fast tracking across the ocean, just a tad to uh, Sweden and going north to the industrial region of Dalarna, which is still making forestry, sawmill, pulp and paper, is that we have uh, created a wonderful new um, um, sustainable house of the future called Villa Zero. Um, right now, that is the um, first genuinely carbon neutral uh, residential house in Sweden, and they're thinking it might be the first of its kind internationally. The, the interesting thing about Villa Zero is that it comes out of an industrial ecosystem mapping project where we mapped connectivity between companies, and then we were able to put companies with different capabilities. In this case, we created a joint venture between an architecture company and a structural engineering company, and in turn, a joint venture with Sweden's second largest residential home building company to come up with this sustainable house of the future called um, um, uh, Villa Zero. And the, the really interesting thing about this is that this pilot project has also come through a, a spin-off organization that we've created called Women Building Sweden. So now we have women CEOs working in sustainability, helping to create Villa Zero, and the house itself was built by a team of women uh, tradies. And what that shows is how these projects can be bring together gender, an open environment of trust, tap into a deep ecosystem of companies collaborating together to in fact support that transformation. Now, the interesting thing coming out of this pilot is that um, with the other houses they're building across Sweden as the second largest home, um, building company, is that they've reduced their overall carbon footprint as of this project by 15%, and that will compound through to 2030. 
So, Amazing. Amazing. So, so that's uh, an example of um, that company. But also it's the, the spin-offs that it creates because it's also working with 30 other suppliers. And one of those, in fact, is a, uh, a new company called Top Cell, um, a high-tech uh, company developing insulation as a waste product from forestry. And you'd go in there and you think, oh, my God, pipes, tech, automation, the only thing missing is a couple of robots. And um, so what they were able uh, to do was to support the testing and the trialling of this uh, new insulation, which is now going into the residential houses. And as a result of this project, we also have some 20 to 30 suppliers who are now being trained in circular economy practices. Yeah, it's, it's these things, so, it's like a, it's just the, you build momentum so rapidly. And, you know, as again, listening to this, I, I just reflect on, you know, there so, must be so many places within the US that similar thinking can be applied. You know, uh, you, you know there's obviously some timber industry here, but also regions where you've got uh, all the suppliers into the coal mining industry that desperately need to reposition, think, maybe I not think, this year, but soon. And I think this is the really important work that Ryland's also doing in, in the US is, is where you have a community of interest and purpose and most importantly, trust. And the one thing we know about Scandinavia and Germany, there's an institutional structures and foundations that support these high trust thriving ecosystems in countries such as Australia, America, the UK. We have, we have very different, it's much more market um, um, driven, much more individualistic. The thing is, how do we put the community into this industrial regeneration that in support, in turn supports investment, as we've seen in the case of Sweden um, in this, um, uh, in the uh, building construction and uh, housing uh, yeah. market. Uh, and yeah. that's something that we have to look at in Australia. And having worked in uh, the US, it's certainly something that our um, American friends need to be looking at in terms of how do we go from short-term transactional to long-term investment in that ecosystem where companies and people can genuinely support each other and share the information to move forward. And I think... Um, um, uh, Ryland's projects and the and the uh, and the sorts of initiatives that he's involved in and the educational elements, we need to turbocharge that with a bigger role for the public sector and government. Yeah, and look, that's that's a great segue into to come back to Ryland, which is, you know, so you you made the Kiss the Ground film a few years ago, and you've done you mentioned a short film in the chat as well more recently. You know, where now? What are the big things you've got coming up? And, and how can people help you? Mm, thank you. Um, yeah, it's, it's actually really, uh, it's an exciting time for Kiss the Ground in that we just May 17th, we launched a campaign um, called Regenerate America. Uh, soil is our common ground. And so in the way that our film which has been seen over 6 million times um, around the world has been translated in 26 okay. languages. Um, and it really has lifted all boats as far as understanding uh, regeneration, regenerative agriculture as a real uh, opportunity um, for economy and business to sort of, you know, start to become uh, inventive inside of understanding um, regeneration of of land through producing um you know food fiber and fuel and so um you know our our objective with regenerate america is um we thought well currently in the u.s the biggest sort of juggernaut of legislation that holds our food system in the place that it is is the farm bill and for those that don't know it's basically a, a bundle of legislation um, that gets rewritten every three to five years. And it ultimately is about 80% um, attributed to um, nu nutritional supplementation like food stamps, SNAP, which is about 80% of it and 20% goes to uh, the farming industry. And so our objective is to 
Um, we've created a coalition of about 70 different organizations from, you know, well, well-known brands like Ben and Jerry's to Timberland Boot Company um, to food companies, soap companies, also farming groups. And so our objective is that we're trying to create an unprecedented um, coalition and grassroots effort that really drives enough awareness about the farm bill, its importance, and our ability to influence it. Um, and we're actually, my partner is in DC today, actually meeting um, with about 20 different congressional offices um, that have been really receptive and excited to the bipartisan nature of regenerative agriculture, um, because it really does, you know, it's about, you know, more um, resilience, it's about more, um, uh, less dependency um, on, you know, any having a, an ecosystem be more self-sufficient. Um, and so, and it also is really about how to, how do farmers actually become more profitable? You know, that is the, the real brass tax of reality is that there is um, more and more proven models of regenerative agriculture where the whole sort of save the world aspect of it is secondary to the, you know, the economics of, um, you know, a system that requires less inputs. Any business knows if you are paying for more and more inputs every year, more and more uh, things to make your business function, and your price is not necessarily going up to match that, you're going to ultimately, your business is going to be worse and worse off. And so, um, you know, what's exciting is that there is these real pioneer practitioners who we've been able to highlight and elevate their stories and even now bring um, farmers and, or bring legislators to experience a regenerative farm or ranch in a district that they represent and have a transformational experience. And again, I, I know that you know, what we're really focused on is advocacy and education and how do we hit these, you know, key sort of um, junction points of transformation to unlock potential. And, you know, we've obviously been, you know, communicating to sort of thought leaders, business leaders in the food space. Um, and now we're focusing on how do we use our storytelling and our ability to communicate to, you know, some of the the folks that make decisions uh, on ag policy to see if we can actually get, um, you know, incentives uh, for farmers that actually help them uh, build healthy soil and build more biodiverse and more localized food systems. Um, and mm -hmm. so we're, our goal is that we, we're, we're going to shift resources in the 2023 farm bill, which is basically $850 billion of taxpayers money um, that is, um, could even small percentages going in, in new allocations could make massive differences, uh, as far as, you know, the direction of our food system. Yeah. I and so, sorry, go on, Raiden. No, look, I think that's so important. And, and first and secondly, congratulations. That is such important work. It just takes so much time and, and effort and, and lobbying. And my hat goes off to having worked in executive political space in, in a previous life. I absolutely know how difficult it is. And, you know, all power to, to your group and your, and your teams that you're uh, pulling together to do this such important work. You just rattled off, you know, meeting with Trinity uh, Congressional Officers and Coalition of Semi Organizations. This is not easy work. It's painstaking and it takes a very long time. But what I found really interesting is also the narrative that you're talking about. And that's really important. And you think about farmers, you know, it's heart, it's mind, it's using the hands. And I think about um, industrial workers, same, hands, heart, mind. And, and so there's a, there's a narrative here, uh, particularly if you think, and if, if, excuse me now, because I uh, don't know the US that well, but I'm just going to think of Pennsylvania for a moment. And, you know, thinking about the agriculture that uh, occurs there and also um, all the industrial uh, work that they do um, across manufacturing. And yet we see so much um, uh, of manufacturing linked to agriculture. And yet we have this disconnect between the industrial part and, and the farmers. And in many respects, we have um, a similar, you know, in terms of, of being workers and, and, and sharing that 
common thing of, of working with the hands and working with the heart and um, and doing the best that they can under difficult circumstances. And this is also the interesting possible political connect between those progressive agricultural farmers and also those progressive manufacturing companies and, and workers um, who um, uh, that they employ to actually start developing deeper connections to actually find those solutions. I mean, we talked about John Deere earlier. They make, they make tractors. This is a complex manufacturing production system we're talking about. In order to change how that tractor works and plows, it has had to retool. My father was a fitter and turner. I understand what it is to retool, to make something new, to put onto a tractor. So these are really powerful things and potentially interesting, powerful co political coalitions that could maybe extend into the future. Anyway, that was just a little bit yeah. of a brain and, and Yeah, I think that's right. And I know, you know, one of the challenges here in the US is there is a lot of support provided to the agricultural sector. You know, some of that flows through yes. the insurance arrangements, which, of course, many countries have significant agricultural insurance support. Australia doesn't for what it's worth. No. Uh, but my understanding, and I'm not across the detail, is that there are parts of that which are really effectively mitigate against adoption of regenerative practices. And so part of the effort in this campaign um, and this, you know, having talked to some of the folk on the West Coast, is absolutely to try to remove some of those barriers to action as well. I don't know if you've got any comments on that, Ryland. Yeah, we, we're, we're working um, with six different priorities, um, which I, I know that the website was just dropped down there um, in, the, in the site. The website's quite, quite um, well done. If I don't, make, if I don't, if I don't uh, uh, yeah, I'll save myself. Um, Please do. But, the um, yeah we're 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 working in you know the, what we're prioritizing is we need we need uh, updated refined education right you know the education is um, you know even in the conservation programs of the NRCS which is the USDA's attempt and you know not attempt but their system for supporting farmers in understanding conservation there's just you know there there needs to be updated. Um, educational materials that are really following those that have been most successful and, 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 and crack the code in many ways. Um, so, you know, that's one aspect is improving education. Um, you know, another aspect, you know, the last, what you just spoke about, you know, crop insurance is a, a big deterrent because oftentimes, unless you're um, doing um, specific monoculture agriculture, um, and buying seeds from a particular place and using a particular fertilizer, you actually can't get, you know, crop insurance. So there's, you know, a total deterrent from, you know, moving in a direction, uh, a shifted or a regenerative direction. Um, and just like insurance, who understands if you're a good driver and you're healthy and you're not, or if you're healthy and you're not going to get sick, you get a better rate on your insurance could or should be that if you're doing, um, if you're have a resilient system that's healthy, uh, you could actually get a better insurance rate because you're actually less likely to be um, taken down by um, drought or a flood or, um, you know, other systems of a, a changing environment that are affecting agriculture, um, you know, so much, which is what insurance typically is um, protecting and giving farmer security against. So, um, and then, and then there's an aspect of, um, there's an aspect of infrastructure, uh, you know, that speaks to, uh, you know, uh, Rodin about, you know, the infrastructure, um, you know, right now there's very little localized infrastructure for anything alternative to, you know, corn, soy, um, wheat, um, you know, even, you know, processing of animals, uh, you know, there's the, the local processing of food systems has been completely, that infrastructure has been taken away. Um, and so there's definitely a need, if we want to diversify our, you know, agriculture, we need um, more money in localized infrastructure. Um, and so, again, from, you know, depending on, you know, the audience that's, you know, listening, um, you know, really, our objective is, 
to create such a groundswell of understanding and support for regenerative agriculture uh, as it relates to the future of our food system and our human health, as well as how it relates to being uh, a solution around our environmental health and climate health. And, you know, having the public really understand that. And, you know, can we have a huge amount of, um, you know, political will being built based on uh, public awareness. And so we'll be creating a, a series of content that can be shared. And we, we, we just launched our campaign video, as I said, May 17th. It's already had over a million um, views. Uh, and we have over, I think, uh, 10,000 supporters and over a thousand of those are farmers in the U.S. So it's, it's been written, you know, the whole campaign is around centering the voice of farmers uh, and having versus, you know, advocating for farmers, but actually not checking in with them first and then making uh, restrictions and challenges that ultimately they have to deal with on the ground. And ultimately we make life even harder for them, which is oftentimes what can happen um, when, you know, creating advocacy for another group. So, you know, actually when we're, we're our, my partners in DC today having these meetings and we've brought uh, three or four farm, regenerative farmers who are, you know, really uh, successful practitioners in this and really having them be the leading voice um, of what they need and what they want and what support the government can play. Yeah, that's absolutely great. And I'm going to bring us back to Matt Polsky's question in a second around forest, but just a couple of comments, I think. First, you know, the point you make about the importance of infrastructure, I think, is incredibly important. If you know anyone in the audience who's not a farmer, like me, probably learned about crop rotation when they were in, in short pants in their middle school, and might be surprised to understand that there's very little crop rotation in many farming systems because it's monocultures grown for decades on end. And actually that just doesn't work very well, which is kind of why we're here. But if you want to rotate multiple crops, you will have different processing directions for those. And hence the infrastructure to support that is a massive, massive barrier to action. So maybe let's just come to this question, which, which Matt Polsky posed, which is how can bioeconomy ideas impact ongoing debates and, and, act, and action about how to take care of forests? And he, he says, you know, my experience is the two areas usually do not connect. So I don't know who wants to go first on you know, a regenerative approach to forestry. Is I think the... Um the regenerative um, component to um, uh, to forestry, and I don't want to sound really dull here, but we've got a, a legislative uh, need to do this. In the case of uh, Sweden, we have incredibly well-managed forests. Uh, parts of individuals' um, uh, pension funds um, are actually tied up in intergenerational forest holdings that get handed down from one generation to um, another. And they actually become stewards of those particular forests. And they're very proud of those particular forests. And they look after those uh, forests in terms of um, the way that uh, timber is um, uh, harvested. And now the thing that makes all this really um, a dynamic space in the case of Sweden is what happens to the timber and how it's actually um, uh, managed um, in order to um, maintain those um, uh, forests uh, into the um, uh, future. In the case of our project, and, I'm, and this is important also for what um, uh, Roland was saying, just in terms of how to build these coalitions up. Now, in the case of our project in um, uh, Sweden, we had um, an industrial organization that supports manufacturers called IUC, member-based organization. We had a um, big dialogue, which is a, a member-based organization of building and construction and engineering uh, companies. We had a cluster organization called Paper, um, uh, uh, Paper Province around forestry and pulp. We had Dalina Science Park providing the tech and the R&D. And in turn, we had the Regional Banking Association supporting entrepreneurship within those companies um, um, uh, to support um, the wood industry. Now, this ecosystem is transitioning to support the, um, the build of um, high-rise timber buildings. Um, 
um, the project supported uh, collaborations, very deep collaborations between the companies in that ecosystem. So for example, we created a collaboration between a sawmill, a building and construction company, which has now resulted in a, um, a surface treatment plant made out of cross-laminated timber, as opposed to um, a concrete steel galvanized uh, factory, where both companies are now integrated um, uh, digitally um, to support uh, design and to optimize production and also to reduce waste. So there's a, there's a bit here of when you have uh, excellent um, forestry management tied in to a bioeconomy ecosystem that is cross-discipline, cross-industry, where companies are supporting uh, each other to take that step into uh, towards a regenerative future, that's where the value is. That's why Denmark is at the top of the Global Innovation Index. That's why the top of the Green Economy Index. Um, and uh, that's one of the reasons that they're also leading in research and development on how to make high rise timber buildings in conjunction with uh, Finland. So this is, this is actually really important in terms of how we view that the, um, uh, the supply chain and that ecosystem right through from forestry and management right through to the timber that's used in building and construction and how it's constructed and how we decarbonize because building construction is going to be the one that we need to tackle along with energy. Yeah, and look, I think that's a great answer, which is the, the, the solution may be not so much in how the forests themselves are managed, but how all the industrial opportunity around that is managed and the associated engagement with the community. And, you know, we're running out of time now, but, you know, you know, Matt's May posted that the recent, you know, from today's Washington Post, the, the stories around uh, timber sales in Oregon. I know we've had recent significant controversy in Australia around logging of mature forests in Victoria. Uh, and so these, these issues aren't going away, but they clearly require a much more, yeah, a, a different approach from whatever's been happening. And to, I was going to say, I, to, I'm going to have to, sh to, to close this off because we're running out of time and I'm going to be strict, but to just to end and in, in under 60 seconds, um, what's one thing you'd like people to go and do after this discussion today? Who's going first? Roland, you go. All right. Um, well, uh, yeah, go watch the Kiss the Ground film. It's on Netflix. Easy, no brainer. Um, it will create a whole paradigm shift of what we're talking about if what we're talking about hasn't made a lot of sense. Um, and then, you know, the, the second thing um, is, um, you know, if go, go, go to Kiss the Ground um, and we have a, a ton of classes and courses called the Soil Advocacy Training. Um, I think regeneration and soil is the most important nexus, um, you know, as it is the basis of building materials and sustenance for life on planet Earth. And, um, you know, we all need to be soil advocates and doing our little part to support soil health because soil health does its part to create life health for all other parts of the ecosystem. Um, and, and then, you know, finally, the, um, yeah, I mean, if you're in the US, uh, I would love everyone to go to Regenerate America and support the campaign that we're building. Um, and if you're connected to an organization that wants to join the coalition, we'd love that. If you're an individual, sign on to just support uh, the work that we're doing. Um, and, uh, and then the, the last thing just at home, um, you know, if you don't, if you don't compost, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's one of the most great ways that as an individual, we can participate in uh, being a regenerator on the planet is actually stewarding our green waste back into the system of soil. And so I'll just leave you with that. Fantastic. And happy to say here in New York City, you can get your building signed up to recycle organic waste so that it goes back into a, a citywide composting system. Roden, over to you. 
I think something really simple, if you've got a pet project that you've always wanted to do and you can't do it on your own, go out and collaborate with a new bunch of people. Go out and find some new people that can actually fulfill that project. And and that's how you that's how you change the world. And the Scandinavians basically show by working across disciplines, working across industries, they lead innovation. And that's where you come up with the new ideas. You keep doing the same old whether you it doesn't matter what you're doing. You have to move out and um, uh, reach out in order to literally break that new ground, create those new innovations um, to move move forward. And most importantly, create new value that's going to create those long-term jobs that we require. And I think um, if you're ever in doubt, go and look at what's happening in places like Sweden and Finland and uh, Denmark. They are so inspiring for how the public and the business sector can work together to create new transformative value in a way where legislation and regulation drives innovation and supports higher wages. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you both very much. My ask would be for anyone who's watching. Firstly, if you've enjoyed this, please do visit the YouTube link and click on the like button because then about 10 more people will watch the video. That's how the math seems to work. Uh, and the other thing, those who know my background will see perhaps there's a new thing above my head, the Earth for All logo. This is a major project that's run over the last couple of years which brings together a whole of world system view, which explains how our natural world and our financial systems and societies interact, and which draws out, amongst other things, the incredible importance of a turnaround of how, how our entire agricultural system works. Much more on this will emerge very soon, and we will. I will attempt to post a link in the chat here now. Hopefully, that will work. Uh, so you can pre-order the book, and maybe there will be a film too. Uh, but it's uh, very exciting to be able to begin to share the work from that. So, thank you, Ryland. Thank you, Rodin, for joining us. A fantastic discussion, and join us next week uh, for those who are interested in our green jobs report. Thank you all very much.